Wilhelm Reich. So good German name there, Reich. But he, his major book here came out, I think in, it came out in the 1920s. It might be 1920, 21. But he was explicit. The two things that need to be destroyed to create the new ideal society are number one, the church, and number two, parents. Hello, and welcome to Thinking Out Loud. I'm your co-host, Cameron McAllister. And I'm your co-host, Nathan Rittenhouse. You know, we really haven't discussed woke or wokeism. On intentionally. Out, not intentionally on the Thinking Out Loud podcast. But I, I wanted to, I think we should. Because, no, I think it is intentional that we haven't. Because mm -hmm. in the past, we didn't find it to be that helpful of a phrase. Correct. But here it's important. Why are we doing it now? Well, it's not going away, for one. <laughs> and the concerns and it's behind... It's morphed, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, this is a very dynamic phrase and it's, it's doing a lot. It's not going away. And because it's dynamic, it's morphing and it's an item of very serious concern for many of us. And the, the, the question of how we respond as Christians is very legitimate and it's important. So that's why we want to bring it up. So let's start with definitions. Definitions are always risky when you have a word that is sort of a neologism that you know, has a tendency to just develop a life of its, of its own in the culture. Another similar example would be the way the word deconstruction was, has been used in evangelical circles, especially to talk about, you know, kind of questioning your faith, taking it apart, or possibly even walking away. That's a novel use of deconstruction, deconstructionism that doesn't bear too much resemblance to its mm -hmm. origins in French theory. So just, just take that qualification in mind. But I have two two definitions both both of which are true of woke that i think will i think there'll be large agreement on on both of these probably but the first is woke is a kind of innocuous one woke means an awareness of social injustices mm -hmm. so there's the that's actually when when that word first started gaining traction sort of just in our everyday cultural conversations. That's how I understood it. This was several cool. years ago. I, I'll give, let me yes. give you an example. I'll give you an example of how this word is used in this way. <clears throat> so <laughs> this is too stereotypically perfect. Austin, Texas, 2016. Um, mm -hmm. I was listening to, that was probably the first time that I was engaging, listening to people use the word woke and it was all positive and it was right. by more progressive leaning people when somebody said, oh, you know, I'm concerned about, I see this happen. You're like, yeah, that's because you're woke. And it was a compliment. Of like, mm -hmm. your eyes have been opened and you see this structure of this crisis for what it really is. So that's mm -hmm. the, the positive seven years ago way in which people use that as a compliment toward each other. I'm going to guess that 99% of our listeners have not heard it as a compliment in the last year. Right. Yes. So that brings us to definition two. <laughs> so if definition one is you know, awareness of social injustices, definition two, and we'll have to unpack this a little bit, consists in the weaponization of grievances. So we're going to have to talk about this one now and explain, because Nathan, I think what has happened is you have, you have something that comes from a relatively obscure kind of academic field that's made it on into the popular arena. And a lot of people have an intuitive sense that something is very wrong with a certain line of thinking, the woke, you know, wokeism here, as we're going to call it, mm -hmm. but they can't quite put their finger precisely on what it is. That's, that's the problem here. So I think if we can do any active service here, it can be getting the gears, just getting the wheels turning mm -hmm. on what's wrong here and why people's spidey sense sort of goes off here and why woke now is generally an insult and why people yeah don't hear that as a compliment i i remember too nathan the the young innocent days of 20 2016 where it was being used as a compliment as well we've come mm -hmm. we've come a long way since then on on yeah. this word <clears throat> well and so but it's also i think i don't know if those of you listening to this have thought about it but it's kind of odd that you hear you have a theologically conservative podcast who intentionally doesn't use the word woke just because we haven't found it to be a helpful, meaningful, or descriptive. Hey, it's mm -hmm. it's almost been weaponized as a shortcut for a whole category of things, usually in categories where people 
haven't really deeply thought through mm-hmm. what it, it, it becomes a, a shortcut. Um, so, but anyway, on where we go. Yeah. So, Lead us gonna, out, Cameron. Well, let's let's begin with recommending some resources here because I, I we have a smart listener base who are going to who are working through some of this already. And or who may want to know about some or of have the, beat us there on all of the things we're about to say. Correct. So. Yeah, and and, <laughs> and and who? So yeah, absolutely. So who will write into us and tell us what we've <laughs> and school us? But also for those of you who want some of the materials that are helpful here, I would I would highly recommend. I'm going to link it in the show notes. There's an article by Bishop Robert Barron. Some of you will know him. Word on Fire Ministries, pretty prominent Catholic conservative intellectual. He has a fantastic article, fantastic just because it's very clear, and it does a whole lot in very few words. For He wrote it for Acton Institute. Very helpful tracing of the intellectual history of wokeism. For those of you who are a bit more ambitious and want to dig deeper, I've recommended this book before, but I do highly recommend Carl Truman's The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. <laughs> that, that book will give you, that's the genealogy of this. And it really, especially the chapter, if you want to skip ahead, I'm going to do something that I goes against. Oh man, I'm, I'm violating a lot of my own rules here. If you want to skip ahead and go, go to the chapters on the sexual revolution. And that's where you'll get all of the real heavy lifting he does on critical theory. We're going to talk about some of that in this episode, by the way. If but you that's, don't want to read the book, stay tuned. Here we go. Right. Yeah. And he also wrote another one called Strange New World, which is a shorter I think it's a more condensed version, which if, yeah, if you don't have time to read a 500 page or 400 page book, you can read that one. It's also, it's also helpful. So where do we, where do we start? I think what I want to say first, and Nathan, you've got some thoughts here too, because Nathan just is, this is just who Nathan is. He happens to be listening to an audio book on the, on the biography of Napoleon <laughs> Bonaparte, because that's just how Nathan rolls when he's doing his work in in, in the greenhouse and <laughs> in attending to the chickens. But w- the real point of origin here, and this is another really helpful resource here is Oz Guinness, our friend. Just Oz is a fabulous historian as well. I mean, he, he's, his, his day job is sociology, but he's really a first-rate historian. But he will tell you whenever this comes up that the real origin point is the French Revolution. This is really the, the seedbed for notions of of modern radical individualism and freedom and has a lot to do with with where we are today so there's the the there's the french revolution and the aspirations there and by the way the massive smoldering failure there which was a huge mm-hmm. source yeah. of disillusionment to all sorts of eager intellectuals who were you know looking on and very excited about it at first and then Kind of okay, but hold really hold that felt, yeah, <laughs> hold that moment hold in it. history. Well, actually, no, actually, sure. keep uh, bring us up to speed here, Cameron. Talk about just for a minute about what the French Revolution was, because the disillusion that comes on the other side of it and the chaotic nature of what happens in the entirety of Europe has some deep similarities to where I think we are right now. It does. And so, say say something more about okay the, the French Revolution and its aftermath. Well, because we, this if we, this should be a warning yeah, so shot we, for people who want to get too tied up into yes. some of this. It is a warning shot, and and it's also, I guess, a gentle pushback on the constant co- comparison to Rome and how we're we're so much like Rome in decline. Actually, the place you really should be looking. It's always good to look at Roman history, of course, right? But the, the place you really should be looking that's more comparable to where we are now is the is the French Revolution. But part it's important to point out, by the way, that it didn't, you know, part of the, what happened was horrendous, but there was legitimate corruption going on. There was collusion between oh, oh, oh. The, the church and and the monarchy. Yeah, well, I mean, so there, there was the American Revolution before that, which people said right. we had, you know, a, a legitimate revolution against a monarchy. Like, we did that Correct. also. Um, mm-hmm. So you... So it's it's not saying that there wasn't an issue. It's how you go about solving that issue. Exactly. That is yes. the difference. And, and actually looking at those two, comparing those two revolutions is very important and very informative. And that's, by the way, I mentioned Oz. That's something Oz will do. He'll set those two side by side. But, you know, another helpful voice here is, of course, Edmund Burke's famous reflections on the French Revolution. And part of what he... What's amazing about that document, it was originally, it was a tract, and it, he, was, he was really good at writing tracts. <laughs> These things tended to sell really well when he would do that. 
But part of what he's saying there is, look, slow down. Yes, you, you're dealing, you've, you've had some legitimate problems. And he points back in English history to times where they faced unprecedented issues with the crown, for instance. But what did they not do? They didn't tear everything up and rip up the whole system, destroy parliament, all of it, you know, and in this case, destroy the monarchy. They, they tried to figure out how to be, if they had to be in any way creative or innovative, they did so with the utmost care and also with in genuine fear because they recognized how incredibly fragile peace and social order really are. Mm -hmm. Those were all things that were not taken. So what you have, you, we talked not too long ago, Nathan, about the danger of idealism, unchecked, ungrounded in reality. You know, if you want to see that in, you know, just catastrophic proportions, that's the French Revolution, where you have a lot of intellectuals putting their heads together and then trying to, de and then destroying everything that, that was there before them. And then you have chaos ensuing. So, and so, so in the, I mean, there's a, yeah. In the, in the American Revolution, what do you have on the flags? Appeal to heaven, right? So there's this declaration, um, all are created by their creator with inalienable rights kind of language. What what was the fr what was the famous French Revolution one about strangling the last monarch with oh, the guts yeah. of the last priest? Was, correct. Yeah, it's it's that was Dennis Diderot, the, the encyclopedist. <laughs> he said, yeah, something to the effect of, "We will not be free until we strangle the last priest with the guts of the last king." There something you go. like that. Yeah. It's a really beautiful so it, picture, isn't it? <laughs> All right. So just to throw this in here before we Cameron continues, is that if you look at revolutions, coups, takeovers, all the way down to dividing churches. So this is not just this is just kind of in general. And I'm sure there are, and maybe you can think of a counterexample to this, but in ger general, the people who lead the revolution do not become good leaders. Mm -hmm. So, so Napoleon comes to power because everybody who is killing all the kings and the priest was a total mess. And then there's a massive vacuum for st stable leadership. And that's where Napoleon comes from. So Napoleon did not mm -hmm. start the French revolution and did not participate in all of the parts of that. He came in the aftermath of the, de de the destruction of everything and started putting stuff back together. And so I'm, I'm not going to compare Napoleon to the church directly later in this podcast, but there is something to keep in the back of your mind here of what mm -hmm. the role of the church moving forward is on when you have catastrophic upheaval in a culture, you look at who caused the destruction. The culture then realizes that the people who caused the destruction aren't good leaders. Where then do you turn for some guidance and how to build mm -hmm. things and put things back together? Yep. There is a, going to be a parallel there. And so, Bracket that little thought and keep it in the back of your mind. Over to you, Cameron. All right. Well, what I have to say now is going to run the risk of sounding like a conspiracy. And I think in some ways it is not dissimilar from a conspiracy. And this is where I think a lot of people's spidey sense is going off and where a lot of legitimate concern is coming in. But we have had, we have happening in the United States and ha this has been happening since the 1960s. We have a, a revolution taking place. It's a very different kind from the French Revolution in the sense that we're not dragging you know leaders out and slaughtering them or anything like that but so here's where the critical theory part comes in and we i mean again if you want to understand a term like wokeism and where we're at today you've got you have to know history and you have to know intellectual history to make sense of it so that's why we're doing this we're not just super or just nerds use TikTok. Here. this is I'm really sure that'll short you out sure there you go but <laughs> If in doubt, use TikTok and that'll that'll set you straight. But okay, so let's go to a guy who's not mentioned very often named An Antonio Gramsci, whose prison letters were probably his most his most famous thing. Now he died and I think at the age of, of 47 years old. He wrote these when when he was imprisoned in Italy. And he, so he wrote this, I think these were published in 1925 or something, somewhere around that that time time frame he was trying to figure out okay communism something he was a marxist a committed marxist 
he he figured he thought something has gone very very wrong here with with Marxism. So what I mean, how do we instill this? And he was the guy who comes up with the idea of well, it needs to be circulated in our cultural institutions. If we want a different kind of revolution, we have to instill it in the centers of of culture. That's how we're going to do it. All right. So now fast forward to somebody like Herbert Marcuse, who was loosely associated with the Frankfurt School. He distanced himself later on in life, but he was part of that milieu at one point. Herbert Marcuse really was an activist as much as an academic. And he's the guy who gives us that chilling famous phrase, the slow march through the institutions. And this is the idea was if you can if you can get a hold of if you can get the theory, this theory, critical theory, which really has deep Marxist roots. We'll talk about that in a second. If you can get it into education centers, not just colleges, but but schools, you know, get it into the curriculum for children and popular what that what they I think they sometimes still derisively called sort of the mass media machine. But basically TV radio, you know, all the, all the different sources of media, if you can, if you can take hold of those kinds of places, you'll be able to shift the, you, you'll be able to transform the popular view viewpoint. Oh, and hang on. Wait, you missed two. Yeah. Um, so, cause some people have said like his idea was you have to take over the robes. So who, who wears the robes? So your professors like the academic mm-hmm. gown. So you take over mm-hmm. the, the educational system. Mm-hmm. Um, then the, the, the judicial system, the, your justices, mm-hmm. those, those are the other people that wear robes in culture. Um, so you have to you have to get into the legal system and into the law. And also, mm-hmm. the other group of people that wear robes are uh, in certain countries, like the priest, so the clergy. So mm-hmm. if you can do the academy, the legal system, the clergy, in addition to concepts in the popular culture, really, those are the institutions, um, both hard and soft institutions, that really dictate how a culture feels about something. Um so I Correct. just wanted to add a couple other categories in there. Yes. So there are a couple of different ways we can go here for now. I think let me anticipate or try to anticipate some some objections that may be coming from some of the more sympathetic listeners. So social injustice is real. There are massive injustices. So what about that? Okay. I think we need to talk about that for a second. Yes. Social in, there is such a thing as social injustice, absolutely, but it's how we respond to it and how we see it. Our categories as Christians now, just speaking as a Christian, are going to be fundamentally different here. And the real the real way to state this, I think, the most clearly. And Nathan, I'm open to you know some of your interaction here and see, to see what you think. But the biggest the biggest difference here is that most people who are progressive in their thinking are fundamentally utopian at heart. And so there tends to be, there tends to be a very, so some of this stuff will give you a very almost forensic view of corruption and different, yeah, indeed different systems of corruption, but with no category for sin whatsoever, no category Mm -hmm. for fallen human nature. That's massively dangerous for two big, for a lot of reasons. I'm going to just give you two. One of them is that it just it tends to give you a very naive view of of persons. If we underestimate human fallen nature, we tend to run into all sorts of problems with with reality. We don't recognize. I mean, it's just it's a dangerous assumption to make when you're you know from crafting the laws of a land to looking at the order of a city. You know, you you remove some of those safety mechanisms, and you very as we're seeing this by the way in some of our major cities. We've mentioned place like San Francisco or Portland or Seattle, you're seeing these little pockets of chaos because once you remove some of those guardrails, people will not just automatically behave. We're taking for granted social order because there's yeah, an so, underestimation of, yeah. Well, so this is where it's, it's a weird like catch 22 to me though, because, okay, I'm with you. There is a, an almost intentional sticking your head in the sand of the of the heart of humanity in some of these ideas. But then the solution is weirder to me, which is like, well, mm-hmm. since the individuals can't figure it out, clearly the solution is to give the government more power and control over this. Yep. If the system is the broken, the government will fix it. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where yep. I'm like, 
wide eyed, like, what are you what are you pointing to in history that makes you think this is the solution to individual? I think that's where a lot of hearts. I think that's where a lot of people who are blessed to be everyday folks with common sense just they just see that very clearly. And there's an irony here, and this, you know, Patrick Deneen points this out in his book, Why Liberalism Failed. The more you pursue a view of freedom that's purely negative, just freedom from all restraint, right? You can just to, to do whatever you want so far, so long as it doesn't hurt anybody else, which is pretty, yeah, the, <laughs> that's, it's highly debatable <laughs> whether that kind of freedom doesn't hurt people, even if you're not directly trying to murder them, you know what I mean? But let's say that's true. You do that, you lose, you, you have to, in order to sustain that model of negative freedom, you have to outsource more and more and more control to the government. Mm -hmm. Because sure. you lose more and more control of your appetites, your, your ability to self-govern. There's a law of diminishing returns there. You have that negative freedom. So it used I have to a, be understood. I have a Grandpa Rittenhouse quote for this. Oh, let's hear it. I love it. Let's hear it. You pay for, Grandpa Rittenhouse says, you pay for dependency in units of freedom. Correct. And that's absolutely right. Yeah. And so. So you want the government course, to feed you? They get to choose what you eat. I mean, that's mm -hmm. just how it goes. They get to choose what you eat. And, and you're, and, and again, you're seeing, you're seeing little iterations of that. That's why people, even when something is seemingly innocuous, as you're not allowed to buy a big gulp soda in New York because it's unhealthy. Well, some people get really up in arms on that about that because they think I, Big Brother shouldn't be telling me whether I can't drink this much Diet Coke or not. <laughs> but there's, you know, there is a serious principle there. But there's a sense in which also we have to grimly sit back and say we've done this to ourselves. So we've got to part of. So Oz Guinness's Golden Triangle of Freedom, which I think he premiered that in his book, A Free People's Suicide. People always accuse him of being so pessimistic with that title. That's taken directly from a quote from Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> so he, <laughs> he loves to say, well, Lincoln said it. <laughs> but the Golden Fri Triangle of Freedom were three, three you know, part, parts that are sort of mutually dependent on one another. The first is virtue, and then and the next is faith. And then the next is freedom. And, the th and you, you, all three of these, you know, depend on one another. But virtue, a word that's fallen out of fashion these days. But you really do. I mean, all the founding fathers, not all of them were sincere Christians, but all of them were agreed that virtue is absolutely essential to sustain the kind of freedom that we have in the United States. There's no other way to do it. You Virtue goes, then you find decadence creeping in. You find, you, I mean, you're, you're, the seeds are being sown for tyranny and corruption. You have right. to have virtue. So, okay, yeah, there you go. All right. So you're, everybody is listening and they say, okay, we're with you, Cameron. We have to have virtue. How do we inculcate virtue into our culture? And then this yes. is where it gets okay. awkward. This is where it gets well, here's awkward. Where, well, here's so where it's pessimistic. Me, but <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, let me make it awkward and, and hold your pessimism. Let me be awkward first and then you be pessimistic. Okay, so... And so this is where I think James Davidson Hunter is the prophet of our time. So, so how have conservatives attempted to instill virtue into the culture? Well, if we could control the academy and what's taught in the schools, well, if we mm -hmm. could control who's on the Supreme Court and what the laws of the land are, well, if we could um, control and influence what's taught in the church and then also what's in popular culture, then we could just, you know, instill virtue back into our culture in a way that would make everything better. And this is where Hunter mm -hmm. comes in. He's like, do you recognize that what mm -hmm. some guy, and he's not saying this, I'm paraphrasing and connecting what Cameron said, a communist in a cell in Italy said is the best way to change the in, and influence your culture is the exact same playbook yep. that Christian yep. conservatives have been trying to run for the last hundred years or whatever. And so that's why yep. the fight is so wild is because everybody's playing the same game with the same set of tools. And you have some of us who are sitting in the middle of this like, mm -hmm. well, this is awkward. And conservatives are ticked off because liberals are now beating them at the play mm -hmm. that they developed originally. Um, and so it's a oh, wild... They've, they've, won, they've won that battle. I mean, there's no... Yes. I mean, but there, but it's a game no, that conservative Christians invented. That's, right. that's, and, that's what makes know, it sting is when somebody yes. takes a stick from you and then smacks you with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, there's the, there's the pessimistic read on this, which is where you look at the general... I mean, our cultural sense of, of virtue is very weak because our we don't have any civic education. We are there's now. I'm seeing 
I'm seeing a growing interest in history, but for the for the longest time, I mean, we have just as a nation, America is so innovative and forward thinking, but we're allergic to history. And that's a that's a big weakness here. And part of what so part of the things that we can two things that we can do that would be very helpful here is one, go back to history. Start just start reading history. And a lot of you guys are doing this already. Read read about ancient Rome. Read about the French Revolution or, you know, listen to a biography on Napoleon when you're when you're mowing the grass. But that's there's something profoundly beautiful well, okay, and but, protective about in doing that. That's that's not okay, a passive activity, by the way. But you're but you're showing your conservative cards here, Cameron, because listen to the assumption absolutely, you're making, yes. which, which I absolutely think is right, is you're saying we yep. can look at history, <laughs> see how humans acted yeah. and then know something about how humans will act. And I think okay, that's, so let me tell you some, yep, that's, that, that's brilliant. But, but, but the progressive side mm -hmm. of that is going to be Steven Pinker saying, no, it's the, yes. we're getting better. We're getting morally virtuous. And so that's why history doesn't matter to a certain mindset well, of not people because they, because people yep. are different now than they were 12 years ago. Well, it's so worse than that, Nathan. Yeah, man, this is really, well, it's worse because, well, because critical theory gives you it's, it's, we've said this before, Nathan, it's a solvent. So you can, and Look, look, I've, I think I've earned the right to say this. Now, I've done my time looking, you know, p digging through critical <laughs> theory. Read, I've, I've read, you know, I've, 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 you know, read Foucault and Derrida and Judith Butler and on and on. I've gone through these people. And a lot we of thank them, very you for your service. Sharp thinkers, sharp thinkers in their own right. But the, there is, there is a demonic side to this stuff because it just, it's, it just, it can, if you let it, destroy everything it touches. And so, you can, here's, here's the strategy for invalidating history. You just find a given person. I'm going to give you a specific, specific example. This comes from Douglas Murray, who was teaching. He's a, some of you will know his name. He's not always the nicest guy, but he, he makes some interesting points, but he points out a student once who came to him and said, you know, Immanuel Kant was, was racist. You know, he said this and this and this and Murray, you know, kind of said, well, I'm not really sure that he did say those things. It's certainly possible he said those things. But he said, basically, the student, on the basis of that assertion, wanted to not have to deal with Kant at all, not read anything. And he goes, which was really convenient for the student because, you know, Immanuel Kant's not easy. <laughs> <laughs> so in other words, I mean, you can, so there's a way that you can say, well, this person was just a horrible person. You know, I'll give you a, a, an example that hits closer to home for us. Martin Luther was anti-Semitic. He was. It's, it's horrible and mm -hmm. it's a deep shame to 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 his legacy he was now does that mean that everything he ever wrote we just throw it out and we don't learn anything from him well no i think that's and people also are they deeply formed by their times and their place yes does that excuse everything they did no but does it does it offer an explanation that allows us to be less myopic yes it should and you're right nathan i am i am you know sort of putting my classically conservative cards down on the table and saying i'm also one of the fundamental conservative notions is it's so much easier. It's so much easier to destroy something than it is to build something and to maintain it mm -hmm. yeah, and to keep it. So, and that's, that's fundamentally what Edmund Burke is doing in, you know, his reflections on the French revolution. He's saying, you know, it's, it's very easy to knock all this stuff down. What you do in the wake of that, in that smoldering bonfire of your former political system and way of life is going to be very eye opening. Okay. But yeah, yeah, let me let me say something to preempt because uh, I I think I probably said something that was a little bit of a shock there when I said that a, a more progressive negative vision of wokeism and Christianity were playing the same playbook, and and, yeah, and yeah. here's where it gets. So let me clarify something there. I think a lot of people say, yeah, it is the same playbook. It's just we have a better vision, and it's about winning here. And mm. where the church can get helpful here is if we step back from the political dichotomy is to say, but does the way in which the change happens matter? And mm. what are the principles that, that we have to abide by? And what are the Christ-like boundaries of the limits of the ways in which we can engage? So this is where you say, this is not, we're, Christians are, I think, particularly politically, conservative Christians are very much on the cusp of waging a culture war under the guise of a just war theory 
that isn't quite fully thought out of are you willing to seed or are you using are you willing to use the weapons of the world in order to achieve, mm-hmm. achieve your vision of what Christ's goal is. And that's where I think I find yeah. myself and I think a lot of other people are saying, like, pump the brakes here a second. You can't adopt somebody else's style in order c- to critique their style. Um, yeah. And some people say that's no, fire, naive. Fire and some fire. of us would say, no, it's a matter of discipleship. Mm-hmm. Um, right. That's the... Let's press into that for a second, because that's very, very important. I think a lot of people will hear some of what we said, and, and this is alarming. It really is. I mean, and there, are, as I get older, I do the typically older man thing. I read more history, and I get more alarmed, and I have more gray hairs, and I look at my children, and I worry more. You're going to develop think, a Scottish well, accent. What are we going to soon? That's right. Yeah, a good <laughs> Scottish brogue to go along with my worry. That way, I'll sound like a warrior. But what? Yeah. So what? What do we actually do? I mean, I, in answer to your question earlier. Nathan, not just the reading of history, but the real important thing that we need to do is focus on cultivating virtue in our own lives. We can't. So if there's one takeaway from to change the world, it's that you can't change the world. You can change yourself. And a lot of people, I can already hear it. That's not enough. It is, though. It is. So there's there's a phrase that Roger Scruton used a lot that I really thought was was very helpful. He would talk about little platoons of civility that you you, you know, these these as long as you're in a society where free association is possible, where you can form book clubs, where you can, you know, you can get together for discussion groups and you can talk about history and you can talk about how you can get involved in your community and what you can do in your neighborhood. Conservatism is always concerned with specifics of a time and place where you are. It's not some big, huge, vast program. So when we think along those lines, we can work on virtue in our own lives and then see how we can love the Lord and our neighbor in our spheres of influence and in our communities. And that that will make a huge difference because it will start with us because other people who are who feel the chaos, and I can tell you, you know this is true. I mean, if you're a Christian and you're interacting with non-Christians, people know something's wrong. They can just, and it's it's a sense of deep confusion and fear. It's just everywhere. And they can see, when they see the peace of Christ in you, that makes a difference. That's how people get pulled in, drawn in by the Holy Spirit. And so this does make a huge difference. It's more grassroots. It's more humble. It doesn't necessarily involve being in the centers of power. Now, I will be the first, Nathan and I both would be the first to tell you, and so and so does James Davison Hunter. This is his whole faithful presence concept. You want mm-hmm. Christians being faithful cres- presences in all of the major sectors of our society everywhere. So yeah, and that would include in, you know, New York and DC and and sort of our major centers of power, but that's not all of us. In fact, that's not most of us. So Mm -hmm. being willing to cultivate virtue and discipleship in our own lives, that's why I think, you know, obedience to Christ, that needs to be at the center of all of our missions at our churches. That should be at the center of all of our Christian curriculums. I mean, we really, the major focus should be on how do we how do we obey Jesus's commandments and take those seriously? That's how you transform a culture. I'm I'm sitting here smiling in my mind, thinking of asking the question: Is your local congregation a platoon of civility? Is your church a platoon yeah. of civility? That, that's a, that's a um, okay. So this is all very fun and very helpful and interesting to me. Now we're only halfway through. We've only we just now finished your first definition of wokeism. Turn us. Turn the page for us. <laughs> yes. Round, here we go, right. part two. So, well, and the other part I was trying to, yeah, the other thing I was trying to bring up is the danger of utopianism because utop- a utopian vision oh, right. will necessitate wiping the slate clean. That's a very chilling phrase. That's usually, that's what revolution's mm-hmm. all about. It's starting over. And here, I'm going to say some things that are, are alarming. Please bear in mind everything that Nathan and I just said. We'll bring it up again. But... This is there is an insidious and very evil side to this. And this is where and I'm going to name names and you just you need to know where this comes from. It's important because and this is where a lot of people they just intuitively sense something's very wrong. Here's where it comes from. So, so another name I'm going to mention and it's interesting to see the way some of these people ended up. This is Heinrich um, Reich. He was no sorry, Wilhelm Reich. Wilhelm Reich. So good German name there, Reich. But he his major book here came out, I think, in it came out in the 1920s. It might be 1920, 21. 
But he was explicit, and he's explicit in his books, especially these early ones. And then I'll try to hunt down the the name of it here in a second. But he was explicit: the two things that need to be destroyed to create the new ideal society are number one, the church; number two, parents. So the family. It's by the way, if you you dig into critical theory, you will find that the family is seen as a seat of patriarchal corruption. And so it's very important to undermine the family unit. This has a long intellectual history as well. This goes back actually to some of the romantic poets. Percy Bysshe Shelley, for instance, thought that marriage was an absolute travesty. I mean, he really hated marriage. He thought that monogamy was one of the most, one of the worst things that ever happened to us. It inhibited us sexually. But the other, but the way that Heinrich, sorry, I keep saying his name incorrectly, Wilhelm Reich suggested we go about underma- undermining the family unit, and this is this is where it gets very troubling because it's happening right now, is through introducing introducing sex education younger and younger to very young children. So this is why you know the old Richard Weaver's old ideas have consequences phrase mm-hmm. is it really is true. They do. The idea here that human beings are essentially sexual beings comes from Sigmund Freud. Yeah, but I there's mean, and a. We are all heirs to that. Yeah. yeah. Here's the thing, though, Cameron. So, okay, that's serious. But you know where your children yeah. are getting their sexual education? It's not from their fifth grade the school teacher. bus. It's from the Just school kidding. bus and the phone that yeah. you gave them. I mean, so on, right. So that's where that's yeah, where I'm sure. like, if you want to, if you want to be genuinely worried about this stuff, um, right. It, it, it's it's like what's concerning boxing to me, kids, though, we'd be like watch my right watch my right and then kick them in the knee you know like it, it no, feels to me like that's happening to I the church you. where it's like the the political front is where this must be fought and i'm like no actually that's like yeah. you're you're yeah anyway you see what i'm saying like but i've some experienced of this, is this even from other well I've, I've experienced this from other people telling me though well you need to go ahead and talk to your children about this about some of the the issues, you know, say, you know, LGBTQIA plus stuff and all of that. And I've said, no, not yet. They're not asking any questions yet. And I'm not. So the notion that the the idea that children are very sexual, naturally very sexual beings was introduced by Freud. Nobody thought like that. 1984. This is a theory. Right. This is a theory of human beings. And theories need to be tested against the ground of reality. But what is what is troubling is that children a lot of you who are parents know this are starting to ask questions earlier and earlier and earlier than they did in years past because of the introduction of this stuff at earlier ages. So, but Nathan's point remains the main thing that we need to focus on is cultivating healthy, healthy homes of virtue. We have to, we have to show forth the beauty of family as the Lord has made it. And let's just face it. I mean, on another hand, you back up from some of this stuff, Nathan, and it's just, this is why everyday people get this. And people who have educated themselves into imbecility, to use Chesterton's phrase, don't. Everybody knows that. How do you, how do you sustain a society? How does a civilization perpetuate itself? Families, stable families. You take away a stable family, the a civilization crumbles. I mean, people just know that. But people who are really, you know, have, P, you know, certain people who have a PhD have learned that, no, that's not true. And, you know, it's way more complicated than that. And that's not how human beings work. So there are the interesting dynamic that I'm seeing, Nathan, is that there are there's there's a kind of there's a real friction between a lot of people who are just who just want to lead normal, basic, you know, kind of just ordinary human lives who don't buy into this utopian vision but the utopian vision is being preached by people in positions of, you know, in, in basically elite centers of culture. So you got large swaths of the population who don't think like this way at all, but other people who are very, you know, small, but very influential. So there's a little, there's, there are some of those dynamics as well. I mean, one thing, yeah, I mean, more could be said there, Nathan, but maintaining a steady hope in Christ in the midst of all of this is going to be a, a you know a challenge and something that we we you know we'll be we'll need to be in prayer about that we'll need to be working together with our with our churches and but the, it really will involve the until we each make self governance to use the language of the founders <laughs> a priority in our individual lives that's going to be the major starting point which Christians by the way should have a leg up on that one anyway anyway yeah. 
So it's, it's we're approaching 40 minutes here. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, we might have to do a part two or just, this is a long one. Um, because I think, yeah, be, so, let's just keep going here. And if we need to split it up, we will. But the, the thing is that, so look at the reaction to something like drag queen story hour. If you right, want something yeah. that lights a fire under people, there you yep. have it. Um, and can I humbly suggest that that is not the biggest threat to the sexual formation of your child? So is it, you is know, it, a, okay. is it a yep. problem? Is, is it a, I mean, yes. it's so clearly like, it's, it's one of those things that's like so ridiculous that it makes me sad to see people get so fired up about it. Like I, in, in some ways of saying, okay, if you took the energy that people are spending losing sleep over that and applied it somewhere else, um, mm. I, I, does, does that make sense to say it that way of saying like, yeah, okay, this is a problem, but what people don't know how to do is like, so what is my response to that? And, mm. and I'm not here to help you and your church work out all of the details of what you need to do there. But one of the things for sure is to say that actually, if you're interested in the conversations that your kids are having about sexuality, let's be consistent across the board in all the categories there and not make it seem like this is the one thing that's corrupting the mm -hmm. culture. Um, so you can be concerned about it, yeah, but you me, can't be focused on it to the point that you close your eyes off to all of the other ways in which mm -hmm, maybe the practices mm -hmm. even within your own house are um, right pulling at the fabric of what you believe. Well, I mean, and that's, so I think the way I would put it then, Nathan, is drag queen story hour is a symptom of an underlying condition. It's an exotic symptom. And it, you're right, it is a problem. And if it's happening in your neighborhood, it's more of a problem for you. And you do have to, you have, you do have to think constructively about it. But what's the underlying condition here? And I think part of it has to, again, if we, if we look back, it goes to the basic assumptions of our culture, many of which we've imbibed too in the church. This is where we need to guard, guard our hearts and be careful. The notion that you are free to be whatever you want, but also, and here's a big one, Charles Taylor calls this the inward turn. And this, this really comes from, in some ways, from Rousseau and the, the romantic poets. But it's the notion that who you really are, oh, and this is also Freud, by the way. I'm naming all these names not to give you an intimidating reading list or to show off, but to, 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 to tell you, this is why history is so important, there are faces that go along with these assumptions. They didn't just, they didn't just you know, dawn on us. This, I mean, there are people who put this in writing and suggested this. Sometimes what's so seductive about Freud is that he couches these assertions in a scientific idiom that makes it sound very official and very disinterested, when in fact, there's nothing, I mean, it's pure, it's pure speculation. There's, there's nothing scientific about it, but the notion that you are, who you really are is, in, is, is who you are inside. You have to turn inward to, de to define yourself. You have to look inside. Nobody should tell you who you are. You alone should tell you who you are. You self-define. That's fundamentally false. It's not true. It's not even practically true. At all. How would you even but, but, know what yeah, you want okay. to be apart from? Yeah. So that is absolutely true. But that does not only apply to drag queens. That, I, that is alive and no, well in saying, every single church and in the heart of every single Christian. That's what I'm saying. Christian. We've imbibed it. Absolutely. That's why, Nathan, I was just at a university up the street and the message I was giving on one of the chapel services was, you have to be told who you are. You do not know who you are. You have to be, first of all, other people have to tell you who you are. For, you start off with family, friends, and teachers, and schoolyard bullies who, for better or for worse, help play a role in forming you and telling you who you are and who provide crucial insights into who you are because you don't see yourself the way others can. After all, you're kind of a conflict of interest there. But fundamentally, you need God to tell you who you are. Why? Because he's your author. That's why. So if that's if, true, to say that you look inward to find out who you are is just false anthropology. But that doesn't like, stop a lot of us. Be yeah. I was going to say, if you would like to watch Cameron stick his face in a fan at a university near you, send us a note at info at toltogether.com <laughs> that, to schedule right. a speaker to watch how this goes down. But here's We'd the thing, though. we glad to send you a, a representative of, to drop this yeah, truth bomb I'm, on your neighborhood. Well, sure. And, and plenty of the students were, I'm sure, annoyed at that. But some, but a lot of them actually, as most people would, recognized it was true. I mean, and I just, I told a story. You can tell stories of your own life. But I told the story about being 
a lackluster student in high school, didn't care about anything but playing aggressive music, and then having English teachers who saw something in me, saw something in my writing and said, no, actually, you are wired more like a writer. This is who you are. And they were right. They had crucial insights and intelligence on me that I didn't have. I needed others to see me. I need my, my parents needed to see one of the really one of the sad features of our life is so many marriages have collapsed in our culture. And two people who are so important in telling children who they are are mom and dad. And when mom and dad are not speaking with a uni unified voice anymore and within the context of a broken home, this does very serious damage to many of us. So we're, you know, we're in a culture filled with a lot of wreckage. I mean, this is where I know this is going to step on some toes, but where Peter Hitchens, for instance, you know, this is, this is Christopher Hitchens' brother, by the way. <laughs> you could, this guy is every bit as fiery and as eloquent as Christopher, and he happens to be a Christian and a conservative in England. So, you know, interesting guy. But he, he says, people bring up drag, you know, drag queen story hour to him or gay marriage. He says, oh, I'm not really too concerned about that. The thing I'm concerned about is what's happened to marriage. And he, his, he's said this for a long time, has basically said the no-fault divorce laws that were signed in, I can't remember the precise dates of those. I think it was the 1960s. But he basically says that was catastrophic for us. That's where so much wreckage begins. So I'm not I'm not bringing that in as some some sort of inconvenient side note. I'm saying part of what has to what we need to be working on when we cultivate virtue is we we've got to show the world what real covenant commitment looks like again, true bonds. And this 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 starts in marriages. Marriage isn't everything. There are people who aren't married. I, I totally grasp that. But marriage is still the civilizational norm for perpetuating the human race. So I take that as important. So that needs to we, <laughs> well, we when need you put to it show like that. forth. <laughs> right. Well, so we need to show forth and that I mean that takes work because it takes pushing against the cultural grain where everybody says, No, I mean, marriage is a completely you know, it's basically nothing more than a contract and you can collapse it at will if you're not, if you're not emotionally fulfilled. And I'm, I'm aware that there are always ex exception, exceptions and extenuating circumstances, but I'm just showing you the cultural headwinds are so strong. This is why we really do need to be part of Christ, his church and his people in order to be counterformed against all of this around us. So, so link us back around then to we got off on this virtue and thing. Link this back around to wokeism definition one for us. How do we pull this back around and, and, and tie this up? Well, wokeism definition one is just the, the recognition of social injustices. The way, I mean, I'm not sure if there's a way to, to tie this up other than that. We, we want to have our eyes open to injustice, of course, but we absolutely necessary I would say as a Christian, speaking as a Christian person now, is the recognition of humans of sin and fallenness. See, without sin, also, you know what else you lose? You lose forgiveness. You can't, there's no, mm -hmm. there's no real category of forgiveness. And you see that in our culture right now. If one, if you violate cultural orthodoxy, you are out. You well, are see, ostracized, you are scapegoated. Yeah, th yeah. This has been my longtime criticism is that it's only that certain forms of this are only halfway theological because it definitely believes in guilt, but it yes. doesn't believe in forgiveness. Well, and so that's the that's a the works, crippling danger. Yeah, it's a works-based salvation. No, it's, it's a completely believes... works-based salvation, very but legalistic. Even, but even then, yeah. it's it's not clear when you're... For, but it's it's works-based salvation isn't quite right, because even in a works-based salvation thing, there is something you can do to make amends and atone for and this doesn't have this doesn't have an end date to it. Like there's not there you can't complete mm -hmm. the atonement. And so no, there's no there's not there no, there you can't. All you can do is is basically you can adopt a posture of permanent sort of self flagellation. Humility, self flagellation, yeah, all of that, which in, looks increasingly to a lot of people looks very very kind of hypocritical and like you're posturing. <laughs> yeah. But no, I mean I so I think I don't know a, of a way to bring this home. Well, I think other than here's, what, to, here's what we've said. Here's what we've said is mm -hmm. here is a term that is massively popular in our culture as a way of describing the brokenness of the world. 
And if you want to describe the brokenness of the world, the Christians would all say, welcome. We've been working on this for a long time, and we mm -hmm. fully believe that it exists. And actually, we have some meaningful things to say about it and some tools to begin to put things back together. Um, so it's, it's not recognizing that there's a problem in the world that makes you woke. Because we've been there. Jesus saw there were problems in the world. Um, that's the whole point of it. That's not the issue. It's what you do in response to seeing that there are problems in the world and who you think the savior of it is, is where we radically diverge with some of the options presented for us outside of the church, whether they be um, conservative, liberal, whatever political party, whatever TikTok influencer, actor, actress, Hollywood, whatever. Like all the whole thing outside of the church to mm -hmm. me is one giant ball of the same lump of tasteless wax. And let me just go ahead and say, I think we need to do a part two on the wep weaponization piece and how that's okay. and how that how that's being used to silence people who have because I think that's the other major piece we've traced kind of a sort of a, a roughshod. We, we've given you kind of a crash course in the intellectual history, but also now looking at how how this is used as a very help, not a, not a very helpful, but a very effective tactic and strategy to silence people with actual arguments. Yeah, because okay, when you, that. yeah, when you, yeah, that, that that the whole weaponization of grievances, and which is an, that's an offensive way to put it to some people, but it's not it's not inaccurate actually, and I think we need to talk about that. And more and more people are kind of pushing back against that. There, there are, this is where, yeah. So I think we'll do a part two on that. You can so look yeah, for that in, we're going to push the pause right weeks. here. We're going to push the pause mm -hmm. right here. Tune in next time to hear Cameron talk a lot about Jesus and French philosophers. And we'll give some <laughs> helpful, helpful, hopefully uh, hopeful ways to think about the way forward for the church here. Because I, this is where it gets odd for us, Cameron, because I, I, we're you're very optimistic about the future of our culture and mm -hmm. of the church and a lot of things. So, well, on one hand, or maybe not the culture, but definitely of the church, of saying, church, let's yep. let's call a spade a spade. Let's be honest about where we are. But then, if you're a Christian, you have this whole other set of tools to help you navigate that. So mm -hmm. that's fundamentally what we're always trying to do on the podcast is kind of work through like fostering a livable Christian hope of saying, are there broken things? Yes, that's yep. true. No denying. But also we have this other set of skills and these resources. We mm -hmm. are not left as orphans and we have the peace of Christ. So um, I think we've, we've had a lot to think about here this morning. We're going to hit pause, but definitely come back for part two where we complete this conversation. You've been listening to Thinking Out Loud podcast where we think out loud about current events and Christian hope. Thanks for listening to Thinking Out Loud. If you'd like to learn more about what we do, book Nathan or Cameron, or if you'd like to support us financially, whether through a one-time donation or on a monthly basis, you can do so on the donate page at www.toltogether.com. That's toltogether.com. And please consider leaving us a five-star rating and sharing this content with your friends. It really does help.